Dr. Scott. All too often in debates about immigration, the effects of immigration on the well-being of American citizens are left out of the conversation. Lately, the focus has been on immigrants themselves. On the one hand, we are told that immigrants only come to take advantage of opportunity for a better life, and they should be allowed a pathway to citizenship. On the other hand, the anti-immigrant argument increasingly focuses on the illegality of the immigrants' presence and the refusal to grant the sick quote unquote criminal population amnesty. Concerns about individual and social costs seem to have taken a backseat to this kind of moral posturing, whether we are a nation that will provide opportunity to all or whether we are a nation of laws. To a certain extent, this has always been the case, but in the last two or three years, ever since our last debate on immigration reform, this has dominated the conversation. So it's a kind of a morality play that's going on. In their article, Steve and Karen attempt to bring about a, a, bring a substantive issue to the table, the effect of immigration on the employment of teenagers in America. As a historian, what strikes me about, about their paper most is that they're arguing that, in a way, they're, they're making a bigger claim than Steve and Karen seem to make. Something fundamental has shifted in our culture. Something fundamental is shifting in our culture. For most of American history, I'm sure most of you know that we've expected children and teenagers to work. This is the history. We, we need not go back so far as to say the farm life, but we know that that's what farm life was all about. We also know that with the rise of industrialization, we once again expected, well, people expected children to work to such an extent that we had to put child labor laws in place so that in an industrial society that we did not abuse children's labor and, and so that they could go to school and develop themselves. So we've always tried to strike this balance in the modern era between children acquiring the skills through work and going to school and becoming educated. Now, like most people in America, I, you know, I, I'm a historian, I'm, most of the time I'm thinking about the 19th century and the 20th century. When I look at the world today, I, when I look out, I'm looking out the world, not in the, with the eyes of a sociologist, I'm just a casual person, you know, and I live in a subdivision, I hang around middle class people, and we all have a conversation about children today. We all tend to participate in these conversations. And my neighbors will say, well, children, you know, the teenagers won't work. So this is not just a concern that people have about wealthy people. We all seem to think, and this is all walks of life. I've heard white people say it. I've heard black people, Hispanics say it. We can't get the kids to work like they used to. And usually when people start talking about the lack of some population to work, we'll just simply sum it up in one word, lazy. We assume that, that the people who are not working are lazy. I've heard this argument when I've done interviews in the South about the local black, black population, and you scratch it a little bit more and you'll find out that, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's something about opportunity. It's something about wages, the standards of the wages, and this is what it is. And so what we're seeing then, what we're witnessing, is that individuals and corporations both seem to be making a decision not to employ teenagers. And when I say individuals, I, I, it's something we note. Steve and Karen point out that adults are doing the work that children used to do. So let's put the question of immigration aside. We have professionalized the work that's historically been done by teenagers. So a kid who wants to make money can't simply borrow his parents' lawnmower. If you were like me, you didn't have a lawnmower to borrow. You couldn't even take the first job to make the money to buy the lawnmower, you know, get a little work, borrow a lawnmower, and then you buy your own. Because now you're competing with people who cut lawns professionally. And I'm struck by the fact that, at least in my community, it's not cut by individuals. The lawn services, they bring a crew in. 
and it's capitalized in a way that kids can't capitalize anything. So the crew comes in with a truck, with a trailer, big riding lawnmowers, two, three side lawnmowers, gas, leaf blowers, and they're done with a yard in 15 minutes versus the kid down the street. If he were not lazy, he would do it by himself with a lawnmower. He would have to have the gas-powered edger to do as good a job, and maybe his mother or father would not want him with the gas edger because it might just get your ankle. And so we're looking at the professionalization of law. And it hadn't struck me that that was where little was going on. So it was really unfair to the kids to think that they can compete with adults. And when you walk through this, and even when we start talking about babysitting with the au pairs, and you say, OK, yeah, I live in New York. Yeah, everybody had an au pair except me. <laughs> I didn't have one. It was not because of money. It was really because of a backward set of values according to these other people, which said, Family, only family can deal with my kids, <laughs> okay? So we do it ourselves or we get a cousin, but no stranger. But so many people did. And so who were these old pairs? Well, these old pairs were people who would come from abroad because at bottom, they had more human capital. They had more human capital. They brought something to the table. They might teach your kids how to speak a different language, exposed to a different culture. Now, mind you, indigenous Spanish speakers would have performed that same service, right? Maybe. But there's something more about human capital than that, just that language in this estimation. 